everybody. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good. As you get settled and in your seat, it's such an honor and a privilege to be in the house of God. Would you agree? Amen. I hope you agree because there are some people right now being persecuted that would love to be in this place. And they are, I wouldn't even say they're hiding in fear. Because I don't think that they fear. If they did fear, they wouldn't be joining together. And so it is an honor and a privilege. When you think about what's happening around the world today, that should really hit you and sink into your spirit. We got people that are scared to join church because of whatever reason. And then we have people that are looking in the face of death saying, come get me. I'm still going to go to church. Because I believe in the body of Christ. I believe. They must have literally have taken that scripture that says, do not forsake the assembling together. They must have really taken that to heart in the countries that they're being persecuted. So if they can do that in other countries that do not exercise freedom, how much more so can the body of Christ that lives in a land of freedom come together and join and exercise and sharpen? each other up and build each other up. Amen. That's why we come together, church. We don't come together to lift up a man. We don't come together to hear a worship band. We don't come together just so that we can fellowship. We come together to edify the body of Christ, to lift up his holy name, to give him praise that is due to his name, and to sharpen each other and encourage each other. And so at this time, would you stand to your feet? We welcome all those that are still coming in, all those that will be joining us in just a few moments, and all those that are online. And you say, man, you're coming in strong. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm simply quoting Bible. <laughs> Amen. We are a Bible-believing church. We are a seeker-friendly church. We, we, we are a seeker-friendly church in here. If you have not noticed, we seek to be friendly to the Spirit of God and Him and Him only do we seek to friend. We don't seek to comfort anybody. We don't seek to pat anybody on the back. We don't seek to fluff your feathers up. Matter of fact, we want to ruffle your feathers because that's what God says to do. We are an army, church. We are not this little wussy, simplified body of believers that are hiding. We are an army. How many of you know that an army shows their force by just simply appearing? By just simply showing up, you can tell how strong that army is. So when you show up in the midst of everything going around, what you are doing is showing just how strong you really are. And you say that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Nothing can come near my dwelling because I am under the shadow of the Almighty. And though a thousand may fall at my left, a thousand may fall at my right, nothing can harm me. I must be the only one to believe that. I sincerely believe that. Nothing can harm me. So I want to encourage you, join with me as we open up in prayer. And I don't want you to sit there just with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and just listening. I want you to be participating. I want you to help us all come together. Because there's already been people praying. There's already been people tilling the ground. There's already been people tending to the ground, making it ready for the rain from heaven to fall so that it can heal our land. So, Lord, we thank you today. We magnify you, God. We, we lift you up today, Lord. We magnify the name that is above every name, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, one that no one can even come close to, one that is so far high above everything, every principality, every force, every demon. None can come close to you, God. And so we lift you up into the rightful place that you are seated on. You are seated in heavenly places. You are at the right hand of God seated on throne of righteousness and we can now come boldly to the throne room of grace because what you did on Calvary because the veil has been ripped 
And so, God, we come and we thank you for the opportunity that we get to be into the presence of God, that we get to experience just a little taste of heaven here on earth. Because how would it be if we were not ready for when we go to our eternal home? And you said, I would love for you to experience that. That's why I said, let your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we get in line with the prayer of Jesus let your kingdom come. Your will be done here, God. Here, God, in the midst of us. Let the glory of the Lord fill the temple. Let the train of the Lord come throughout all the aisles, all the seats. Let the tangible presence of God fill this place today. Oh, as Solomon said, in Solomon 1.4, he says, draw me and we will run after you. Draw me. God, let that be the heart's cry of every individual in this place, that you would draw us and we would run after you, that you would draw us, that our heart would long to be in your presence just like the deer who pants toward the water. Let our souls long to come to you and drink from the fountain that will never run dry. Drink from the water that produces life and not death. Let us be drawn to you, God. That we would drink from the well of eternity, that we would drink from the very one who came to give us life after we forfeited it, the very one who came and restored his breath back into our beings after we exhaled and did everything we were told not to do. Let us drink from that one. Father, and just as Solomon concludes that verse he says draw me and we will run after thee and then it switches because he said the king has brought me into his chambers will we be glad and rejoice in it we will be glad because now he has heard our requests we have cried to draw us Lord and you heard it and you have invited us into your chambers and now we will be glad and rejoice and we'll talk about that more than anything else in this world because you have allowed us to come in and be with you. Draw me, he says, and we will run after you. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will make mention of your love more than of wine. Rightly do we love you for who you are. The gospel is that he has heard your cry. The gospel is that he invites you to his very presence. The gospel is that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The gospel is there is nothing in between you and God. And now that is more the reason for you to shout. That is more the reason for you to rejoice. That is more the reason for you to dance in this place. So can I get a shout of glory for God. Lord, we welcome you today. We honor you today. Have your way in this place. As we lift up our song, as we lift up our dance to you, receive it in Jesus' name. Can everybody say amen?
Just begin to worship in this house.
You rose and fit 
We stay in an attitude of worship. Father, we lift up our brothers and our sisters in Afghanistan today. I ask that your angels be loosed over them for protection, hiding those that need to be hid, Father. But not only for the believers do we pray, for those that are lost, Father. The blinders will be removed from their eyes, that they will see the truth and repent and give their hearts and their lives to you. As we see the word of God unfolding before our eyes, doesn't stop your word being sent forth to perform what it's sent to do. We thank you for your mercy, God. Your mercies are new every day. We're so grateful for your mercy upon your people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I heard something in my spirit this morning as I was preparing for service. And it was like I could hear someone crying out to the Lord going, what did I do? What have I done that this isn't working? And I heard in my spirit, there's nothing that you have done. There's nothing that you could do that wasn't covered by what he did. Mark 11, 24. You know, sometimes you got to be careful because, you know, the enemy can be Slick is the word that keeps coming up. He can be crafty. When we're desiring something and believing God for something, he can keep you in a place where that's all that your eyes are fixed upon. And so when it doesn't happen in the amount of time that you allocate that it should happen, you begin to question And then when you begin to question is when doubt can set in. And so when he 
get you to start questioning, well, why or how long or what did I do? You need to reply to that and say it's not about what I did. It's about what he did. He paid the price. His blood was shed. So that we would have the availability to stand in his presence. And Jesus, the only thing you have to keep hold of is your faith. That's what he wants is your faith. And so we, when he can get you pressed up against a wall with time, pressed up against a wall because of with finances, pressed up against a wall because of why because, is where he wants to keep you so he can steal your faith. Mark 11, 22, and Jesus answering said unto them, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. And so I just want to encourage you this morning. When your eyes want to get focused on what you're believing for, get them refocused on the one whom you're believing to do it. We can get, especially here in America, we can get so caught up in the thing we're standing, the thing we're believing God for, that it becomes an idol unto us without even knowing it. And so if you feel yourself pressed that way or you feel yourself saying, how come it hasn't happened yet? What have I done? Take a step back because you've got your eyes off of the source and you've got your eyes on the problem. Or you've got your eyes on what you're standing and waiting to have manifest. It will come. It will come. I don't understand why things may take longer than other things. But one thing holds true. You don't let go of your faith and it'll come. Don't let go of your faith and it will come. No matter what anybody says, no matter what it looks like, no matter what makes sense, because a lot of times, church, faith makes no sense. So I encourage you this morning, get your eyes back on the one who can make a way where there seems to be no way. And every time that rises up within you, how long is this going to take? How long do I have to stand? Tell it. It's not about me. It's about him. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. Well, you may be seated. Those of you that are online, we want to encourage you this morning. Please hit the like button, make a comment, share this live stream because the word of God is available to go into places that we can't take it by live streaming. And we just thank God for the opportunity that we have to live stream. All of those that are serving in our media department, making this happen, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you guys so much for everything. You know, we're going to move into the portion of our service. Uh, first of all, we greet you. If this is your very first time here at Cornerstone, this is your first time viewing online, we welcome you. Let's give our guests a round of applause this morning. Welcome to Cornerstone. We're so honored to have you here with us today. And on your way out the door, just stop by our information desk. They have a gift waiting for you, and they just want it, the ability to say hello and welcome you and uh, just get to know you a little bit better and ha hopefully have you come back and be a part of what God is doing right here with this church in this place at this time. Amen. Amen. So as we move towards our tithes and our offerings, praise God. 
You know, um, I got to thinking about, you know, you, you've been taught about the tithe, and the tithe is the tenth of your income. But I thought, you know, that it's not just giving, giving unto the Lord to get. I mean, there's a principle that he's laid out. It works. Give and it shall be given. That, that's, that's the word of God in action. But we also give unto the Lord because it says in John 3, 16, for God so loved, so loved, so loved the world that he gave. He gave the most precious thing that he had, and that was his son. He so loved us, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so I thought, what, what a more wonderful way to give because we love him. And we love what he's done for us. So we give unto the Lord. The tenth is just the beginning. But we give because we love. We love him for loving us. Amen. So I have a little uh, testimony here. Um, it says it's an example of the proper attitude in giving. Love for God, not money. So we have a model giver here, and it's found in the life of a gentleman named C.T. Studd. Now, I know all of you guys out there would love to have that last name, Studd. <laughs> but um, C.T. Studd was a Christian world champion cricket player in the 1800s. And when his father passed away, he inherited 29,000 pounds, which equals out to, to about $150,000 back in the 1800s. Now, that's still a significant amount of money in the day we live in, but think about the, how much that was in the 1800s. It was a sizable amount, even to today's standards. But not wanting to clutter up his life, Stud decided to invest his money with God. He sent 5,000 pounds to Hudson Taylor, who organized the China Inland Missions. How many of you have heard of Hudson Taylor? Great missionary. He gave 5,000 pounds to William Booth, who's the founder of the Salvation Army, and 5,000 pounds to D.L. Moody to start a work in India. Although Moody didn't go to India, the money was used to start Moody Bible Institute. After completing all of his giving, Stud had only 3,400 pounds left, which he gave to his wife on their wedding day. And listen to what his wife's response was. The rich young ruler was asked to give his all, so they sent the remaining money to General Booth anonymously so they gave it all they kept none for themselves and I love the fact that it says because they didn't want to clutter up their life you know and, and God I'm not saying God is speaking to you to give all that you have today but it's the principle of giving out of love and that's what we're going to do today we're going to receive our tithes we're going to receive our offerings out of the heart of love this morning amen now, the way we are doing this here at Cornerstone at this time is uh, if you need an offering envelope, you can raise your hand to those that are here with us today. Our ushers will get to you. We will pray over the offering, and then you will bring it forward to our offering containers that are here in the front. And for those of you that are viewing online, there's several ways you can give. If Cash App is still up there, I'm asking you not to use Cash App, but to use uh, PayPal or uh, text to give right now. We're having some complications with that app, and we're still waiting for their um, tech department to get back with us to get those things corrected. So there's different ways you can give. You may want to mail your offering in. There's a P.O. box that you can do that. Are you guys ready to give this morning? Are you ready to do it with love? All right, let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the opportunity we have to give our tithes, to sow our tithe, to sow an offering unto you this morning. And we choose to do that, Lord, because you loved us first. 
And it's just a way we can respond back to you out of love and to give. Thank you for receiving that gift and blessing it. And everyone in agreement says, amen. You may come forward at this time, church. So at this time, we're going to dismiss our C kids to their classes, uh, four-year-old four through, well, what, if you're kindergarten, thank you, kindergarten through fifth grade, you can be released at this time. Let's give our young ones a round of applause. Hallelujah. And at this time, let's also give a round of applause to our lead pastor, Pastor Arnold. again good morning good morning hey real quick we got a couple of things coming up uh pretty fast actually in a couple hours one of them is uh so we just want to invite you for those of you who went out with us um, a couple of months back when we did our street team ministry we have that coming up today at three uh it, we're going to go out at 3 o'clock today, but if you're interested in doing that, I know we had a sign-up sheet and we wanted you to uh, attend a couple of classes, but if you didn't get to, um, don't let that hold you back. You can still come. You can still be a part of that ministry. You can still go out there into the streets, what Jesus said. How many of y'all know Jesus said that? Go out into all the world. We're not asking you to buy a plane ticket. We're just asking you to come here and go a couple of miles, okay? So... You can, you can meet him in the middle, all right? Let's meet him in the middle. You don't got to go to the world, go downtown. Uh, <clears throat> but if you want to join that, we, we strongly encourage you to come and be a part of that. Uh, we've had great success. Uh, we've done it twice. This will be the third time. And, it, uh, and we plan on doing it more and more and more. Uh, but we would love for you to be a part of it. And we don't... We don't set these things up just so that one or two people can show up. We set these things up so that you can be a part of the call of God and going out into the world and the commission. That's what he said. I commission you. I send you out. You know, we're not saved to sit. We're saved to be sent. And if you come to Wednesday night, you will learn that too, amen. We are doing Wednesday night discipleship class. And so if you come to our Wednesday night classes, we will teach you how to implement on uh, the word of God, how to implement that and how to become a disciple, a true effective disciple of Jesus Christ. It's not one who just sits in a church. I knew it was going to get quiet when I said that. That's what a true effective disciple is. It's not one who just sits in a church and just feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. No, we don't need you to be spiritually fat. We need you to be spiritually fit and go out into the world and exercise your faith and share it with everybody. And so if you want to uh, be a part of that, we uh, set up a time to come here at 2.30. We will be going out at 3, but you come over here at 2.30, meet at the church. We're going to be passing out some waters and, and uh, just ministering to people, praying for people. And uh, we do, though, strongly, or not strongly, we do say do not bring any kids uh, to this one because of uh, the fact of where we're going. It's not kid-friendly, and, and it's there's no parks or anything like that. The first one we went to was Cole Park, so the kids could kind of go off to the side and, and play, but there won't be any playground where we're going. Amen. And so uh, 
like I said, we strongly encourage you to meet here at 2.30. If you are going to come, you're going to plan to come, please let one of the leaders know. You could get with Pastor Gene. He's actually heading up this one. And so you can get with him so they can make sure that they don't leave without you. <laughs> amen. Can I get a better amen in this place? All right. Well, what the Lord has had me been preaching these past couple of weeks is something that I didn't know we were going to step into, and it's actually actually really become a series. And I did not realize it until yesterday, until I was like, oh, we're continuing that. I really wanted to preach this, and he said, nope, you're going to continue on this because people need to know. And so what we've been talking about, we, we started with uh, prophesying two weeks ago, and then we started talking about um, last week on how to to speak the word of God and declare it in your life and how powerful your words are. And in case you didn't notice or in case you didn't know or you weren't informed, your words are very powerful. They have, whoever came up with that idiotic phrase, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt was just trying to, I, I don't know what they were thinking, because it could not be farther from the truth, because words can hurt, words can help heal, words can bind, and words can loose, words can frame your whole future, believe it or not, because you can build up a child and start declaring over them since they are a little baby and start speaking blessing upon their life and start telling them, hey, you can do whatever you put your faith to do. Not whatever you think you can do, but as long as you put your faith and you rely on God and you build them up, they will come, more than likely become something great. But you can take that in a negative way and start cursing somebody all the days of their life and their life will reflect the words that were spoken over them. And so we find that the words of what we speak are vital, not just to Christians, not just to people who put their faith and trust in God, but to everyone walking on this planet. Because we know that the word of God is what framed the world. If you believe in this Bible and you believe it to be the unadulterated truth, the unaired, not nothing wrong, spe specific truth of God, we know that God spoke and it became. We know that he framed the world by the very words that he spoke, that he looked into a, a, a dark world, he looked into an empty world, a world full of void and darkness and spoke and light appeared. Well, that is what your words can do in your own life. You can look at a situation, you can be dark alone, you can be terrified, you can be scared, you can be on the verge of the cliff, but have a word spoken. The Bible says a word spoken in due season. How many of you know that there are times in your life that you really need a word in that time, which is that due season? And God, if you allow the Spirit of God to speak to you in those times, you will overcome. But the very truth of the Word of God that could build you up, taken negatively, the Word of the world can break you down. And so we have to be very careful what words come out of our mouths. Remember what we talked about to prophesy? Paul says, I, 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 I wish, you know, desire all the gifts, pursue love, desire all the gifts, but I wish that you would prophesy above all else. Why? Because you're speaking forth. And when you speak forth, it draws in the world. Remember that? If you don't remember two weeks ago, I strongly encourage you to go back and listen to both messages last week and the week before. We talked about how Paul says tongues is great to the church, but in order to be effective in the world, you have to prophesy. Because if you prophesy and declare the word, it will bring that sinner to his knees and say, this must be God. So words are powerful. The word 
is powerful. And he said, you need to finish this. And I said, okay, what are we going to talk about? And he said, you've already taught them to declare. You've already taught them to speak in their life. You've already taught them that the word has to get inside of them. But I need you to talk about their thoughts now. I said, okay, Lord. So let's talk about your thoughts. Father, we thank you for this day that you have blessed us with, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of God so that we can renew our strength, so that we can gaze upon the only one that is worthy to capture our gaze, the only one that is lifted high and seated in the heavenly places, that one that we choose to gaze upon today. And through the gaze, let the shifting of our hearts, the changing of our spirits, the, the, the fixing of our thoughts take place by the Spirit of God, the only one who knows the thoughts and the intents of our heart through the Word of God that is sharper than any two-edged sword. Let it cut, let it pierce, let it remove all that needs to be removed so that we can glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Words can shape a person's mind. They can cause you to think something that isn't even true. They can cause your mind to grasp facts that can be twisted, and if you take them in, they become truth in your life. But truth supersedes or trumps facts that are twisted, which is why you need to be careful what you think upon. Because if you think upon the truth, the word of God, you can have facts thrown at you all day long. But your heart is steadfast, rooted, and grounded on the truth. And facts don't mean anything when you have the truth. Well, I don't really believe that because facts are facts. Yes, but facts depend on how you see something. I can see something a certain way, and to me that is a fact because that was how I saw it. Doesn't mean that's the truth because my vision can be tainted in the same way. And so I'm looking at something, and I'm saying it. To me, it's facts. But if I don't see, you ever you ever seen a basketball game or anything? And like it's it's so funny, right? Because if the referee can, uh, depending on their perspective of what they're seeing, they can say, "Oh, nothing happened." But then they have this great thing where they turn the camera to a different view where he couldn't see it, and in his mind there was a fact, there was no foul. But then they change the angle, the perspective, and then that fact is superseded or trumped by the truth because he could not see it. And so the devil likes to throw the facts to you that you cannot see to try to get you to believe so that you can allow it to become truth in you and break you down because your perspective is messed up. Well, you need to change and shift how you see things. And allow the truth to permeate through your whole being so that the truth can rule your life. So that the truth can rule your mind. Are you following me? It can beat a person down so low that they open the doors to harmful thinking. And thus given an invitation to spirits that will cause havoc and destruction. It's amazing what words can do, that how they can play with your mind and cause you to believe. They can frame a person's world and reality and determine just what that person will be. Just like we said, they can limit one's capacity and capability. Raise somebody up thinking that they are only limited to the color of their skin. Raise somebody up thinking that they're only limited to the block that they live in. Raise somebody up thinking that you'll never amount or go past this way and you will handicap the capacity of which they ever attain. 
But raise somebody up thinking, just because I did this doesn't mean you're confined to what I do. As a matter of fact, you're going to go further and go greater and move beyond what I did because I'm not going to raise you handicapped in your thinking. I'm going to build you up and say, hey, yes, this is where I've gone, but I've gone this far to push you the rest of the way. And so when you get that in your mentality, things begin to change. They can blow the boundaries and limitations off natural circumstances that can try to place those circumstances or those boundaries on them. Regardless, whether you look at them in a positive way or a negative way, words can cause you to shape how you think. They'll shape your mind and cause you to stay up at night. You can have somebody speak something negative or curse you in a way that will cause you to actually lose sleep because it just replays in your mind, in your mind. Or maybe it was a circumstance or situation that happened to you and you allowed those words or those thoughts to come embedded into your mind and you will actually lose sleep because your mind won't turn off. Has that happened to anybody in here other than me? Because I had that happen. And then on the, on, the, on the other hand, I've had it happen to where I've been so excited about words that it keeps me up. Exciting. And I feel like I was asleep the whole night, not even sleep. You see, you could feel like you haven't slept because of words and be so exhausted. And you can feel like you have slept. In actual reality, you were so excited, but you feel refreshed. The words are powerful, but how you think is just as powerful as those words. And so I want to, we've been talking about the words, but I want to focus on how you take those words and think about them. Jesus, well, before I go into Jesus, God knew the instruction or the power of the instruction of words. He knew how powerful they were. Why? Because he created them. He is the word, the Bible says that, that Jesus is the word. And he says that he came down as the word. The word and him are one. He is God. And so he knows just how powerful spoken words are because the spoken word of God became flesh to demonstrate the power of the words of God. But just as powerful as these words are, so are negative words. And so he understood that. So throughout the Old Testament, we see people who were named out of circumstances and see people who were framed by words spoken over them so much so that God a lot of times changed their names because their name placed boundaries on them. Their names stopped what God wanted to do. Well, what do you mean their names? Because when their name was spoken, the words would get deep down into their minds, thus getting into their hearts and thus limiting what was taking place. So he would have to change people's name from Abram to Abraham father of many nations why because he saw what he was going to do with him and therefore he had to speak and allow Abraham to start thinking changing his thinking allow it to come into his heart and then see the fruit of that why is that because words are powerful <laughs> If they were not powerful, Jesus would not have said, this is the first scripture, there will be many. Mark 4, 24, he says, pay, this is the, the New Living Translation. If you can bring this up, I love the way that it's worded, because if you just say, take heed to what you hear, you're like, ah, oh, that doesn't really hit me, because I'm not in the Elizabethan English. But if you change it to a more modern translation, he says, then he said, play, pay close attention to what you hear. In another gospel, he says, pay close attention to how you hear. But right here in Mark, he says, pay, pay close attention to what you hear. 
So if he's telling us that, it must be pretty important. He says, because the closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given and you will receive even more. He's talking about his words. He's saying you need to pay close attention to what you hear. My words pay close attention because the closer that you listen to, the more understanding you will be given and you will receive even more. We'll take that and and change it into every word that you hear. You need to pay close attention to what you allow yourself to hear because you will be given more understanding. You will allow what you hear to take root and frame what you're hearing. It will frame your life, and then what you hear, you'll start understanding that more. So if you hear something negative, If you allow the negative report, if you hear something bad and you allow it to come on, you will begin to understand that more than what Jesus is saying. That's why he says pay close attention to what you hear. And then he says pay close attention to how you hear. So you got to pay close attention. Whatever you listen to will shape your understanding depending on what it is that you're listening to. It will shape you and how you think. Whatever you think is what you will become. We talked about this a couple of Sundays ago. Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinks, a man thinks in his heart. So is he. So pay close attention to what you hear because what you hear will get into your mind and you will start thinking that. And when you start thinking it into your mind, it will start going into your heart and it will eventually become who you are. For out of the abundance of the heart... Man speaks, Matthew 12, 34. Are y'all following me? Take close attention to what you hear, because what you hear, you will eventually think, and what you think will eventually become into your heart, and what you think in your heart you are. This is all Bible. This is not some deep foundational, fundamental revelation. I mean, this is foundational, fundamental word, not no deep revelation. This is what Jesus says. It's simple, but it's truth. Whatever you hear, however you hear it, you will eventually begin to think it. And when you eventually begin to think it, it will go down into your heart. And then, therefore, you will become how you think. It's so bizarre that we do not watch what we hear. And then we look at our lives and wonder, some of us, how we got here. Christians, too, like, like we're only, we're, we only guard, like, some of our lives and not everything. And then when we're not guarding everything, we're looking at the part of our life that's messed up and we're wondering how we got here. It's because you didn't guard everything. You know, it, it's, you ever had water in your ear, right? And it's like a horrible feeling. You're like, ah. Well, why? Because there's a hole there. Well, in the spirit, it's the same thing. Be careful what you hear because there's a hole there and you can be filled good things or bad things. But it'll get inside of you and it can either feel good or you can get irritated and be like, ah, what is going on? Nonetheless, things will get in. And you don't believe me, go to Colossians 121 verse 22. Verses 21 through 22. The power of words that can cause your thinking to be something that you really aren't is so vital to understand. It's so important to grasp this fundamental truth. 
And yet, believers think that they can listen to anything and it not have any effect. Therefore, we'll listen to music. We'll listen to, to, to people cussing all day long. And I'm not saying to shun those people because you're called to be a light. But watch what you hear and how you hear. Because you're not supposed to be so secluded that you are not effective. But you're not supposed to be engulfed in everything that they're saying in the same time. And so you'll take in all these songs about, man, I don't know about you, but when, when I used to uh, be younger and everything, I was a Christian. I was born again and everything, but I went, when I was going to go play basketball and I was about to go up against these tall dudes and everything and these guys that were bigger, man, I would listen to some crazy rap music just to pump me up. Or I would listen to uh, some, some crazy, some Linkin Park to, to, to get me because it was a hard, kind of like a hard metal uh, rock band. I don't know what it's called, but, but just to pump me up when I was going to go lift weights. And it would take my mind somewhere. Not realizing that it's taking it and in doing, allowing that music to play, it would get inside of my spirit and in my soul. And would begin to change the way that I thought when I just wanted to get a little boost to pump some iron, <laughs> but I was allowing those words to be deposited in me, and then it would change my thinking. Beware, child of God. Beware, son and daughter of God, of everything that is speaking today, everything that is going around today. There are facts that are being shifted and twisted to cause you to fear and allow the fear to come down in you. Don't be secluded, but combat those fears and those thoughts with the truth of God. I know people who have gone through some crazy experiences within, the, within this last year. I know people who have gone through some heartbreaking times that have lost loved ones, that have, that have, have had have people that they care about on ventilators and die. I've had people that I'm close with. I got my brother that is struggling right now to, to breathe and to, to, he's having a hard time because he got the virus. And, and I know what you're going through. But I choose to combat those thoughts with the very thoughts of God. I choose to stand on the truth no matter what the facts look like. And I allow this to come into my ears more than I allow all the noise. Because that's all it is. It's just noise trying to distract you, trying to get you to fall off course, trying to get you to stop. You know what you're doing is you're allowing the news to become more of your God than the actual Word. If you're listening to that more, then you're listening to this, then you're allowing that to become God because the word of God is God. And if you're not listening to him more, then you're allowing an idol to creep up. And just like Miss Catherine was saying, you're looking for God to do this and it becomes an idol before him. And so we need to be very aware what we're allowing to feed our spirits and our souls because without even realizing it, it'll change you from the inside out. And I do not want you to go on like this and then somewhere down the road you have that experience like what happened? How did I get here? What was what you were allowing your mind to think upon by what you were listening to, and now it has developed into something. Colossians 1, 21, he says, And you who were once alienated and enemies of God, where? In your mind. I bet you a lot of y'all never caught that part in the scripture where he says you are alienated and enemies in your minds of God 
the way you were thinking, the way you allowed the circumstances of everything around you, you allowed it to come into your mind, into your spirit, into your heart. That's what made you the enemy of God because of how you were thinking. You were thinking, oh, I'm so shameful. I've done this. I've done that. How could he love me? And he's saying, I love you no matter what. And yet in your mind, you cannot conceive that. You cannot comprehend it because your mind is messed up, therefore making you the enemy. Your perspective is, I'm an enemy of God. And God's saying, no, you're not. I love you. But your mind is so wrapped up in what you're thinking because of what you heard. You made yourself an enemy of God. He said, you were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. You see, so they allowed wicked works to change how God saw them in their mind. Yet now he has reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death. And yet so many Christians still believe in their mind they're still enemies, even though the word of God says you're reconciled through the body in his flesh of him dying. And you cannot wrap your mind about what this next part says to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in whose sight his sight but in your sight in your mind you're still busted disgusted broke and unworthy but in his sight you're 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 holy blameless and above reproach but in your sight, you're still unworthy. I can't ever do anything right. Why? Because your mind has allowed what has gone around you to think that way. I'm never going to amount to anything. Yes, you're not. Because you're allowing those words to come upon you into your spirit. Start combating those words. You know, I was, I was having conversations with people. I have conversations all the time with people, in case you haven't realized that. And people just tell me things. And you know what? We're going to pray for people. I have people message me all the time about prayer for people that are, that are going through a rough time. And we will pray for them. I send those prayer requests to the prayer team. Uh, and they pray for them. And they fast. And they pray for them. It's just not like, oh, yeah, I'm going to pray for you. No, we, we pray. We pray. But, like, I was having a conversation with somebody, and I said, tell me why you think that. Tell me why you think your life is not worth living. Tell me why you believe that. And it was all in their head. It was everything that was in their head that caused them to believe that their life is not worth living going, not worth living, all in their head. Everything is in your head. This is the battlefield, which is why he says that. You don't believe me? Check, check, check this out. I, I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say it. I'm, I'm going to go through it really quick, and hopefully you grab it. Genesis 3, what, what happened? Where, what, a lot of people think that it was, it was uh, the, the, the devil twisting the word of God, which he did twist. But if you go to Genesis 3 and you actually read that, it says that the serpent was more cunning, which means he was, he was more slick, like Miss Catherine said. And, and, and he knew how to twist, and he knew how to manipulate, and he knew how to get people to think contrary to the word of God. It wasn't that he twisted it. It was that they believed it because they allowed it to think. They were thinking upon what he was saying. So Eve gets manipulated to think about that was the sin that she started to think about what he was saying. She didn't watch what she heard. She allowed it to come in, and she said, oh, no, the Lord said this when he actually didn't say that. But verse 4, he says, you will not surely die. 
in Genesis 3, verse 4, for God knows that in that day you eat of your uh, you eat of it, your eyes will open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, tell me this. Why now all of a sudden was it desirable? She's seen it this whole time. And now, all of a sudden, because she gives uh, heed to what is spoken, what was spoken has now conditioned her mind to change how she sees. Because she saw the tree, and it wasn't desirable until he started speaking to her. But now, all of a sudden, the words that were spoken have now gotten into her mind, into her thinking. And now she sees things a little differently than she once saw before he ever came in the garden. Now it looks good. Why? Because you've allowed what he said to come into your mind, giving birth into your spirit. And now it has changed how you're seeing things because you were once supposed to see through the lens of God. But now you're seeing through the lies of the enemy. And now it looks good. It didn't look good before, Eve. It didn't look good before. Before, y'all were just walking. You knew the tree was there. It didn't tempt you before until you started listening to the words of the enemy. Be careful what you hear. Sound like Jesus, right? Was she not able to see the tree before the devil began to speak? Yeah. So the words that were spoken came into their minds, gave birth to an action that was settled in their hearts and caused their reality to become contrary to what, was it, to what it was intended to be through God. It caused their reality to become contrary to what God intended it to be. All because they listened to the words spoken And let it become their thoughts. And then God in verse 11 says, who told you that you were naked? Nobody told them that they were naked. Nobody did, but because of the thoughts that they allowed to penetrate, because of the serpent that knew that if I can just get it to, for them just to listen to it, I know it's going to take root. For them just to hear my voice and for them to even consider maybe just a little bit, it's going to take root. And what they saw as not a problem will now become a problem. And as they saw themselves with nothing to be ashamed for, now they'll see themselves naked and be covered in shame and they will grasp And go for what was never meant to be covered. And they will pull that on instead of pulling on God to cover themselves. Nobody told them they were naked. God says, who told you you were naked? They don't even answer the question. Adam says, no, it was this woman. You never answered the question, Adam. Who told you? Oh, maybe it was their mind that told them. Why? Because they listened to the words of the enemy and it got down in their heart and they became disgusted. They became shameful. That's why he said how you were once alienated and enemies of God in your mind. He's talking about Adam and Eve. But that went down and progressed and transgressed from Adam to Eve all the way down to human. Every human thought that way until the blood of Jesus covers them and changes them. And that's why Romans 12 says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed in your body No, be transformed in your spirit. No, be transformed in your soul. No, where are you supposed to be transformed? In your mind. Because of what you've been listening to, what you've allowed to creep into your spirit has altered your mind to think opposite of God. And therefore you've become opposite of what he says you are. And so to declare the word is some is is very important, but to actually believe what you're declaring 
is just as important. So we need to fix our way of thinking. And you say that's all good. You've never been through what I've been through. No, I haven't. But let me burst your bubble. You're not the only one that's gone through it. In your mind, you believe nobody else has gone through this. Nobody else has gone through this pain. That's the trick in the enemy of the devil. You're the only one. You're the only one that knows what it feels like. You're the only one that's gone through this. You're the only one that's being looked at. You're the only one that's being talked about. You're the only one that's never going to make it. you got all the chips stacked against you. You've got everything going wrong that could go wrong, and it's going to stop you. That is what he's trying to get you to believe. The fact of the matter is, it is not truth. But you can make it truth in your life if you choose to believe in there, in that thing that is being spoken upon you, in that thing. Well, you don't know my circumstances, man. I've had it rough. As a matter of fact, everywhere I go, I am reminded of what I've done. How am I supposed to get past this? How am I supposed to see the light at the end of the tunnel? How am I supposed to get in line with God's thoughts? Yes, he even said it. You see, the devil can twist this. He even said it. Your thoughts are not my thoughts, so what's the point of even thinking? If I'm never going to think the way he thinks... Your words are not my words. What's the point of speaking if the word says that we're never going to? No, that's a trick of the enemy, twisting the word. He's saying your thoughts are not my thoughts, but if you can line up with me and allow me to think in you and allow me to speak in you and allow me to do these things in you, I can get it through you and we can change where you're at. But he'll twist it and he'll say, no, you'll never You'll never, 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 ever, ever. You'll never get to that point because it's going to cost. You know, some of us can't change what we've done. We can't change it. We, it it'll always follow you. Wherever you go, that stigma will always follow you. You're just a Mexican. You ain't going to amount to nothing. You're just black. You ain't going to amount to nothing. You're white. Oh, you got more privilege. Oh, so you're going to amount to something? No. It doesn't matter what is following you around. Y'all don't sound too convinced. Because... I'm glad you don't sound too convinced. Go to 1 Chronicles 4. It will further illustrate my point. You see, well, God changes their names all the time to get them away from their past. I can't change my name. That's just going to be weird. So you have what you went through following you and people constantly reminding you that is who you are. And so if you're, how am I supposed to change what they're saying? You can't change what they're saying, but you can change how you're thinking about what they're saying. And one day, they'll stop saying it. But even if they don't, that's the part of Christianity that people don't preach just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we will not bow. Our God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, I'm still not going to bow. That's that unpopular part of Christianity. Even if I do die, even if I don't get healed, even if I never walk, even if my leg don't grow back, even if I lose my house, even if, you see, we, we need a, a, a generation, a remnant of Christians that still got that mentality. Yes, I'm believing, but just even if I still will not bow. Got news for you, a lot of people would bow in this day and age. I pray that we are not as close to the end as we think we are because a lot of people who said they wouldn't bow will bow. And it's sad. But you say, I, I, I can't get away from it. Well, there was this guy in First Chronicles 4, and I'm going to close with this. 
9 and 10. It says, now Jabez. Well, God changed the names of other people because he wanted them to, to, to see, well, this guy's name didn't get changed. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. First Chronicles 4, 9 and 10. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. That's a good testimony. But keep reading. And his mother called his name Jabez. That's a pretty cool sounding name. What's, what's the problem with that? <laughs> the meaning behind the name was the problem. Which meant sorrow maker saying, because I bore him in pain. Think about that. The Bible just stops what they're describing. They're describing a genealogy of, the, of, of Judah, and then it just stops and talks about this one person and gives us two sentences. But it's so profound when you look at the two sentences that it gives. He says, Jabez, more honorable. How could he be more honorable? It's funny how he mentions how he's honorable before he described what he was being told. Every time he heard his name, he was saying, he was hearing, you're painful. You're pain in my neck. Every time his name was being spoken. Every time, how could he be careful what he heard? It was his name that he answered to all the time. Well, my problems keep following me around. How is God? His name was not changed. His name was not shipped and shaped and, and formed into another meaning. No, it still meant it this entire time. Because I bore you in pain, all you're going to ever do is bring about pain. Jabez, Jabez, yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, man, I brought, I brought pain. Think about that, your name. You can't get away from your experiences. This dude couldn't get away from his name. Yet before that, the Bible says he was honorable. But his mom, according to her experience, named him by what she felt, not what he felt, not what he did, not what he was responsible for, but what she experienced. She labeled him. That's like having a kid telling them, I never wanted you. I never, you were a mistake. Y'all don't even know why I'm here. I have to take care of you because if not, I'm going to go to jail. So I'm going to take care of you. But I'm not going to like taking care of you because you were never meant to be here. You ruined my life. You, all my dreams I had to throw to the side because you're here. Jabez was going through this every time his name was spoken. Because you brought about pain. He was constantly spoken in a bad way and had his life framed by what others experienced. Not what he experienced. Not what he had control of. He didn't have no control over any of this. Yet the Bible says he was honorable. Most people would be fed up. Most people would have a sour attitude. Most people would be pretty ticked off for a, a, a church word there. Yeah, you throw in your word that you want to say. Most people would be like that. But he was honorable? Hmm. Every time his name was called, it was being declared over him. That all you will ever do is produce pain. All you will ever be is sorrowful. All you will ever amount to or all you will ever bring or provide in this world is pain. Did he cry out to God to change his name? 
And all of us are saying, God, if you would just take me out of this. Why did I have to be born of this family? Why did I have to be born on this block? Why did I have to be this race? Why did I have to do this or do that? And you're crying out and you're mad at God. And Jabez had every right to do so. But he says, no. Verse 10, Jabez called on God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be upon me and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. And so God granted him what he requested. He never asked to be taken out of the situation. He never asked for, for, Lord, if he would just speak good things over me. He never asked if they would just give me a nickname better than pain. He never asked. if he, he Matter of fact, he never said I'll never not answer to that name. He just said, if you could change me in the inside, and if you can do something, if you can enlarge my territory, if you can enlarge my capacity to think differently, if you could enlarge how I see myself so that other people can get a hold of how I see myself first, you, child of God, son of God, daughter of God, have the challenge and the issue to get in line with how people see you or to reject how people see you because he could have got in line with the meaning of his name, but he chose to reject it and chose to cry out to God and say, God, cause me to think differently. Don't change anything. Change me. Don't do anything but enlarge me. Don't let me be a person who is confined by what is spoken over them. Let me be a person that will go and then go beyond the territory. They, they put him in a box, and what he's saying is, no, this box is not big enough to hold me. So, Father, enlarge where I can go because they want me to stay here, but I believe you want me to go there. And I need you to do this. And God granted what he asked but he didn't ask to take me out of the situation. He asked to change himself. Philippians 4, 8. Even though he was having the word pain and sorrow thrown on him, he still decided to keep his eyes and focus on God. And this is what Paul tells the church of Philippi. He says, you know what? What you need to do, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever uh, things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What is he saying? He's saying, think. The Amplified Version says, think continually on these things. Center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. That's what the Amplified Version says. Why? Because whatever a man thinks in his heart, therefore he is. So if you are constantly thinking negatively, if you don't think about the thing, what is what is he describing there? Whatever's noble, whatever's virtuous, whatever's good, whatever. It sounds like he's describing God right there. It sounds like he's describing Jesus. So to sum it all up, just think about Jesus. Just think about him, constantly meditate, fix your mind, continually think, and center your mind on them and implant him in your heart. And you will become what you behold. You will become what you think about. And then in verse 9, he tells them to put these things in practice. So you can't just think about it. 
You have to put them in practice as you're thinking about it. Would you agree? Amen. Amen. How do you renew your mind? It's through the word of God. It's through the word of God. You have to put this in your spirit, in your soul, in your, you, Ezekiel, open your mouth and let me put this word and you're going to eat it. And it's going to be sweet and it's going to taste like honey and you're going to be able to prophesy. You're going to be able to declare everything that I'm saying. Why? Because you know my word. Because you know my word. The washing of the word is how we renew our thinking, how we transform our thinking. His word, Ephesians 5, 26, that he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. The word is the water that washes. The word is the water that renews. The word is the water. Your, your mind is alienated by God if you don't have this word in here. You're alienated from God, should I say, because of your mind, because you're not allowing this to wash it. You're not allowing it to cleanse it. You're not allowing it to, to purify. Another Another scripture for your Bible scholars, John, when he goes in to the island of Patmos and he sees the revelation of the Lord, and he's gotten in the spirit. He describes Jesus as this in Revelation 1 It says his feet were like burn it, uh, burnished bronze refined in a furnace and his voice was like the roar of many waters. You see the serpent that was cunning, his voice was like the sting of death. God's voice is like the voice or roar of many waters that will wash you, that will cleanse you, that will bring what people, what, what, what you can go without food, but you cannot go without water or you will die. And his voice is the roar of many waters that you need to live. Amen. Amen. Stand up to your feet. This is more of a Bible study than a preaching. But the Lord is saying that we need to start changing the way we think, man. We really need to because the times that we're we're in, not even going in, the times that we're in are, are, are just, they're, in case you haven't noticed, they're bad and everybody is trying to throw words at you. Everybody is trying to get you to think differently. Everybody is trying to convince you to to uh, go against what God says. That's what they're trying to do. If he can get you to believe a lie, if he can get you to even, you don't even have to believe it. You just have to consider it just like Eve did. All she did was consider it Allow it to be spoken, and it changed her perspective. Now the tree looks good all of a sudden. Now the fruit is pleasing to my eyes all of a sudden. And it's all by what you're thinking. It's all by how you're letting words come into your mind. And in this day and age, you need to guard your heart and guard your ears. Because your ears is the gateway, the pathway to your heart. The Bible says, how can they not hear without a preacher? How can they not be convinced if no one's telling them? Take that the opposite way. You can be convinced in a negative way if you're allowing the world to preach at you. Their gospel and not his gospel. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Father, we thank you right now for your word. We thank you, Lord. I know this is a different feel than usual, but, Father, this is the word that you had for your church, that we would start considering what we hear, how we hear, and allow uh, those things not to be meditated on, but allow your word to be meditated on so that we can speak forth and declare your word with truth, declare your word with boldness, declare your word 
no matter what anybody else is saying. Let us be the church that still stands in the face of death and declares the word of God. Let us be the church no matter what it looks like, no matter what is speaking to us, no matter what is decreeing to us, that we would guard our hearts and we would think upon all that is lovely, all that is holy, all that is noble, all that is you and nothing else. That we would allow your words to frame our world still. That we would declare your word and speak it forth over our minds, over our bodies, over our families, over all those we come in contact with. Father, we lift up all those that have requested prayer for all those that are sick, all those that have been uh, battling this virus, all those that have been under the weather, even though it's not the virus and they still get sick. Father, we decree and declare what your word says, that we were healed and therefore it was already taken care of on the cross. So we step into and receive what you died to give us, God. God. We receive what you died to give us. How dare we not receive the thing that cost your son his life? How dare we, we reject the thing that you came to give us once again? How dare we do that? And yet, some of us do that by the words that we allow to creep into our spirit without ever realizing, well, we put a stop to that. In Jesus' name, we bind everything that is contrary to the word of God. We bind all fear. We bind all depression. We bind all anxiety. We bind everything that is opposite and contrary to what you say is true. And we cast that out of our minds. We cast that out of our thoughts. We cast that out of our speech. Lord, and we start declaring your word once again the same way that Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and boldly preached the word of God. Let us have a day of Pentecost and be baptized with your fire that this fire burns deeper and brighter and hotter than any fire the world could try to bring against us. And we stand in the midst of the fire, in the flames, knowing that even though they threw us in it, you are there with us in the midst. That even though we might go through hard times, you said we would come out of them without even the smell of smoke. That even though we would have to go through rivers, or even though we would have to go through seas, we would not have to go through muddy waters. But just as the children of Israel walked on dry ground, you would cause us to walk on dry ground. But we have to have the tenacity of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That even if, for some reason, it doesn't happen, we still trust you. That is the hope that we have in you, God. Father, I bind everything right now in the name of Jesus Christ over our, our church, over the body of Christ, over the people. Father, every sickness, every disease that would try to come on to the very temple of God is not welcome. Every sickness, every disease, every ailment that tries to get on a believer is trying to get on the temple of the Holy Spirit. And it is an unauthorized foreign entity that is not welcome. So we cast it off. We rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus. We reject that thing just like an organ what just like a body would reject an organ that is not a match no sickness no disease is matching our body so we reject it the only thing that matches is the matchless blood of Jesus Christ that we receive on our bodies now in Jesus mighty name If you're here and you say, I need to, I need to, 
I don't, I don't know this Jesus. I don't know this God that you're speaking about. I don't know him. And, and maybe I do know him, but I've gotten away from him and say I need to get right back in, in his life. I need him in my life. You're just a prayer of repentance away. And that's you with all of us. And we would just, we would just pray right now. Repeat after me. Say, God. I come to you on this day, this Sunday morning, asking you to forgive me, wash me with the blood of Jesus. Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior, cleanse me from all unrighteousness, teach me how to hear your word. Teach me how to meditate on it. Teach me how to believe it. Teach me how to wash my mind, renew my spirit, create in me a clean heart, and renew a right spirit within me. In your precious holy name, Jesus, I pray, I thank you. Amen. 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 There you go. Give the Lord a round of applause. Give him a shout. Give the Lord some praise in this place. Say, so it be unto me, Lord. Change me, Lord. Don't take me out of the situation. Change me. Amen. Amen, church. We love you. We bless you. Don't forget today at 2.30, if you want to go out in the street ministry, be here and be ready to evangelize and be a disciple of Christ. Wednesday night, discipleship class starts at 7. We will see you there. In Jesus' name, be blessed. God bless you guys.